Hi. Hello, everyone, um, and welcome to the Rathbones Folio Sessions in the Virtual British Library. Um, I'm Kate Clanchy, and last year I had the great honour and privilege of judging the chairing the judges for the Rathbones Folio um, Prize. The Rathbones Folio Prize is the only one which covers all the different genres. So it uh, looks at books in, of poetry and fiction, and crucially short fiction, and creative non-fiction all together and looks for the best bits of writing. So that, that's its specialty. Um, and in these sessions, we, we're talking to a poet. So yesterday we I talked to Raymond Antrobus, who was the winner um, the year I judged it. Um, and tomorrow I'm talking to Patrick Gale, who's a novelist. Um, and today I'm talking to Kate Summerscale, who is not really exactly just a writer of creative nonfiction, but somebody who kind of created the genre of creative nonfiction as we have it today. I don't think that any writer or course of creative nonfiction is taught without reference to her works. Um, Kate first published um, her first work in 1997, which was the the um, the Queen of Whale Whale Key. Um, and that was followed up by the suspicions of, Mitch, uh, of Mr. Witcher in 2008, which um, very, very famous multi-prize winning book went on to be a bestseller. And that combination, winning combination of historical accuracy and warm characterization and a mystery is something that lots of other writers have been aspiring to ever since. Um, she followed that with Mrs. Robinson's Disgrace, which is the story of a divorcee. Um, and then my personal favorite, The Wicked Boy, the mystery of a Victorian child murderer, the, the very moving story um, of a child who'd murdered his mother. And I believe that she's going to be telling us about her upcoming book during this session. So Kate, yesterday I asked Raymond if he'd always been a poet um, and he said, yes, he was born a poet. Are you born a writer of creative nonfiction? What drew you to fact rather than stories or stories in facts? Um, I, I think, I don't, I still don't think of myself so much as a writer, as a reader. I really love reading and, um, and that has defined me for far longer than writing really. And I, um, and when I worked in journalism, I was an editor as much as I was more than I was a writer. So I suppose writing nonfiction and doing research is a way of writing through reading because you're constantly gathering information from different sources like a magpie and synthesizing it or putting things together in your own voice, having um, found other voices. So, so yes, I, I guess it's, um, it, it is the closest way of write, reading for a living <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and um, and being able to sort of absorb all that, not critique it in a sort of essayistic way, but just to um, to make use of it. So a lot of my uh, non-fiction structures are drawn from novels. Um, I, I especially love reading novels. And so I think that um, that what I do is is deploy facts in structures that are kind of inspired by film and fiction. Um, and so that's the that's the way that things come together in my mind. You're almost editing them together. Yeah. And in a way, um, perhaps I'm sort of fooling myself there in that it's a way of getting over the fear of the blank page or whatever. I get the material together. And so you lose the self-consciousness of writing because you're actually dealing with other people's writing. And I think that that was um, what drew me to editing as a, uh, as a journalist. And in fact, the first real writing I did as a journalist was anonymous, and it was something very close to editing because it was obituaries at the Daily Telegraph. How fascinating. Which, so you had all this material and you drew them together into lives. Yes. So you, um, and they were unsigned pieces which, in which you had to adopt a kind of authoritative voice while, um, so it was like a kind of impersonation of authority. And it was fun. And it was... Um, and it was a way of kind of getting myself writing, I suppose. And in a way, writing stories that are drawn from historical sources um, is, is continuing in, in that kind of tradition. It's kind of almost tricking myself into writing. <laughs> were, you, were you ever tempted to sort of 
judge them? You know, do they seem as frightful characters sometimes, these people you were writing obituaries for? Well, yes, I mean, some of them really were, but um, because the Telegraph prided itself on, on not only writing about the great and the good, but on just writing lives that were good stories, people who were interesting, even if they were... They'd been up in court cases and things. Yes, yes, absolutely. Criminals and um, people who were sort of on the edge of madness. <laughs> you go <laughs> into the public eye for any reason whatsoever. Um, and I, I wrote an obituary at one point about the man who used to parade around central London with a sandwich board, um, advertising beans, not lust, as a way, beans as a way of suppressing, <laughs> protein as a way of suppressing lust. Um, yeah, he's a chapter from one of your books, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah so yes, and so it was very important not to, um, not to judge, but just to tell you know, and to, um, to leave it to the reader to judge if they, if they wish to. But those, you know, all of those judgments are in the way that you arrange the facts. Yes. And yeah. yeah. So what pulled you to your first character in your first novel? And you're sorry, it was a novel indeed, in your first book. <laughs> um, well, that, that came straight out of an obituary. So I wrote an obituary of this woman called Jo Carstairs, who... I'd never heard of before, but whose goddaughter wrote to us at the Telegraph. And um, afterwards, I uh, learned more about her, and it struck me that I wanted to write, first of all, a sort of longer feature about her, about mm -hmm. the new things I knew, and um, and then uh, I, that I might like to write a whole book about her because she seemed like one of those characters who'd sort of slipped between the cracks of the century. Her life had spanned the century. But, um, so so that, that was almost, it sort of landed on my desk, that idea. <laughs> you know, it came to me and it fell to me to write her obituary just by chance. And, um, and I was very taken with her and her story. And you could see more and more and more things behind her story. Yes. That came through. Yes. Now, you, you, you were going to read a, a little bit of that, is that right? Yes, I mean, yeah. actually, the, the bit I was, I was going to read a bit um, about how I came across the story and decided to write it, so happy to do yeah, that now. Yeah, that would be fascinating, thank yeah. you. Um, so yes, the book was called The Queen of Whale Key, and um, it... This it's is one the, of the Florida Keys, isn't it? Yes, in, in Bahamas. And this is um, from the introduction. At the end of December 1993, a letter arrived at the Daily Telegraph obituaries desk, where I worked, from a woman called Jane Harrison Hall. She had noticed the name of her godmother, Marion Barbara Carstairs, in the death announcements column of the newspaper. Though Mrs. Harrison Hall had not seen her godmother for decades, she was writing su to suggest that she might be a suitable subject for an obituary. With her letter, she enclosed copies of a few American newspaper articles. No one on the obituaries desk had heard of Carstairs, but when I looked up the name in the Telegraph library files, I found a thick packet of newspaper cuttings, most of them reports of motorboat races. It seemed that M.B. Carstairs, born in 1900, had been famous in the 1920s. Always dressed in men's clothes, she had raced for Britain and established herself as the fastest woman on water. In 1934, she all but vanished when she left England to become ruler of the Bahamian island of Whale Key. I wrote an obituary, giving it the heading Joe Carstairs, because this was the most widely used of the many names she took and the piece was published in the newspaper in January 1994. A telegraph obituary is formal in structure. It is anonymous, written in the third person and without overt commentary. It is topped, tailed and interrupted by facts and figures. The age at death, dates of birth, marriages, divorces, education, appointments, honours. This frame lends authority and authenticity licensing the anecdotes, eccentricities and asides for which the Telegraph obituary is prized. In form, the obituaries imitate the unselfconsciousness of the figures they celebrate. In truth, they are mischievous and knowing. But the teasing is laced with affection. At the heart of these pieces is a lament for a century and a spirit which is passing. 
The spirit is embodied in the dotty dowagers and bristling brigadier, brigadiers who people the obituaries column. These are the characters for whom the telegraph obituary might have been invented. Figures who are comically, heroically British. They are untroubled by whys and wherefores. They just are and they just do. They persist in the face of disaster, of ridicule, of a radically changing world. The spirit they represent helped forge the British Empire. During the two world wars, it made for astonishing bravery, the soldier who acted with reckless disregard for his own safety, in the words of innumerable military citations. And in peacetime, it made for fabulous eccentricity. Carstairs was all these things, blithe, bold, courageous, unselfconscious, imperialist, impervious to social change. And like many of the eccentrics who appeared on the obituaries page, she was born to money. She could afford not to care. Yet Jo Carstairs was no dowager or brigadier. She was a cross-dressing lesbian whose fortune was made in the oil fields of America in the years that the United States began to displace Britain as a great power. And though she didn't need to be, she was a relentless entrepreneur. Her ambitions were made the more astonishing by the fact that she was a woman, but they were astonishing, by, but they were overreaching by any standards. Fueled by her money, she pursued a fantasy of autonomy and omnipotence in which she was variously the fastest creature on the seas, an immortal boy and a great ruler of men. Her projects were so outlandish that they took her beyond fame and notoriety to obscurity. An obituary aims to encapsulate how a person looked to the world, not how the world looked to them. It never presumes to enter the subject's head or heart and so renders no interior life. It does not deal in meaning and motivation. After writing Joe Carstairs' obituary, I found that for once I wanted to fill in the delicate gaps that characterize obituaries, name the oddities suggested but left respectfully or wryly untouched. I wanted to know why Jo Carstairs lived as she did and how the world worked upon her. That's a wonderful piece of writing. Thank you. Just um, everyone listening, we are looking for your questions. If you want to set, last, yesterday we managed to get a whole bunch of questions in the last 15 minutes and not enough by half past. So if you've got a question for Kate Summerscale, get it in on the chat box, not the Q&A box, please, because also those boxes are not working together. So on the chat box, get your questions in for, for Kate. And we're focusing on you know, how to write. The title is How to Write Book Now Lunch Hour. How do you write? So when you started, you, you taught yourself how to write that first book effectively, how to. Yes, and I think um, always uh, there's, a ten there, there's a tension between a, the form I'm sort of start with and what I'm working towards. So in that case, I'm describing an obituary, a newspaper obituary, mm. and how a book, the book I was trying to write was a different thing but it did also spring from the newspaper obituary. And it's different in that case, because I'm trying to get at how it felt like to be her and how she looked out at the work, you know, what her, um, instead of, of, of slightly teasingly looking at the way that she lived from the outside. Um, and so, yeah, it was, there's, al there's always that sense of well, what the, there's always a sort of formal challenge like that, mm. that you're trying to do something that you couldn't do in another form. And I think all my books, when I, not consciously and in advance, but when I look back at them, I can see that there are forms, often fictional forms, not necessarily journalistic, that, um, that the books are kind of reacting to or trying out, like the detective novel in The Suspicions mm. of Mr. Witcher or a romantic novel in Mrs. Robinson's Disgrace. Um, that there, there, there's the shape of a, there's this fictional shape or a starting point and then it's what I'm going to do with it how I'm going to reshape it or tweak it or measure the distance between the facts I'm pouring into this mold and what the mold can do and that always is um, essential because the structure of the book is sort of everything and so that's the task of is. Yeah, but you feel your way, you know, I never have a plan exactly in advance, but um, the book never starts working until I know what structure I'm sort of working against. So when you came to Mr. Witcher, 
um, after this first book. Were you originally were you originally drawn to the case, or were you drawn to Mr. Witcher, the character? Originally, police inspector or the crime? Yes. Uh, originally the case, I came across it in a Victorian anthology of true murder stories and I was absolutely astonished by um, the, the horror and the drama of it. Um, it was the story of a, of a little, a three-year-old boy who'd been murdered and thrown down a privy in a, a country estate. And um, then so I wanted to write about it the whole family came under suspicion of the crime and um, it was something that obsessed the nation in 1860 but it wasn't until I started thinking about um, Jack Witcher the detective that I found a way in because uh, although I'd never heard of this story it had been much written about at the time and since, and I needed a way to feel like I could get my own purchase on it, and um, and he provided it. So Mr. Witcher was my um, the door, the, you know, that uh, that opened it, it up for me and gave me um, an angle, a perspective, and gave me. He, he was my guide in a way through the material. I I kept thinking, what did he know at this point? What would he have thought? And by doing that, I could sort of place myself back in the moment in a way that would otherwise have felt too woolly and inauthentic. So, you, you, yeah, he, he is a very strong personality. I think anyone who reads that book feels that they've met him in some way. Slightly uncanny sense. I think I suppose it's because we see what he sees. Do you feel when, but you wouldn't write a novel about him? You wouldn't write? No, wouldn't write. no, Can, because... Do you know why? Well, once I've started on the, I, I just love the fact this stuff is true. I mean, I really do. I'm very excited by the, the sort of frisson of reality and of, um, I suppose I, I, I remember as a child reading books about time travel, little girls mm -hmm. opening doors and going back into a previous century. And that sort of fantasy I think uh, <laughs> drives me and I um, I don't want to spoil it by making things up I don't I want it to remain another world um, and although in some ways I'm laying claim to it by deciding how to tell the story and and, and it becomes my story once I mm. once I tell it I also I like to preserve the um, the strangeness of it and the mystery I, I think I'm always driven in my books by wanting to solve a mystery. And I mm. hope I always get somewhere, some way towards doing that. But also there's always something that remains opaque. And that's really important to me. That well, that in, in, in that story, we all want to know ha what exactly happened. Why did she do it? And you, 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 you don't get there because, of course, nobody really knows. No one can yeah. ever know. There's always a, a blank at the end, but um, hopefully there are just more ways of thinking your way into that blank and, and taking a view. There's enough there to be able to imagine and to be able to, um, to sort of wonder constr more constructively. So I, I, I think, you know, it, it, you don't want to leave things just hanging. You want to get to mm. where almost, <laughs> almost knowing and um but never completely knowing and it strikes me that with a novel um you you lose you, you lose some of the reality um and uh, or the, the historical specificity in reality mm. but um but the, the writer does know the writer can know really sort of what happened and what people were thinking and feeling and i am more comfortable and more interested as a writer not as a reader but as a writer certainly in um in not claiming that sort of omnipotence not knowing yeah not knowing, not knowing. Yeah. So, i mean i felt in that one you wanted there to be a reason and you wanted to let the girl off but you couldn't that there, there, there is some sort of a darkness in there yeah. what about that in the wicked boy there's a feeling of your you've got a feeling of intense sympathy towards the protagonist of that story um what what, what drew you to that what drew you to another child murderer I, d I came across the story, it was a, it's the story of a boy, a um, 13 year old boy who murdered his mother mm. in cahoots with his younger brother. 
and um, in 1895 in East London. And I read the, uh, I came across it in an old newspaper and sort of followed the trail of it, read the accounts of the boys appearing in the magistrate's court and how they were discovered in the house with their mother's corpse. And again, I was struck by the, the horror of it, the sort of unthinkable nature, but I, I, there was something strange, sort of uncanny about the boy, the central character, his blankness and cheeriness which um, intrigued me and, and uh, made me feel that there was more to the, to the story, more was going on in that household and in that family mm -hmm. than had been elicited by the Victorian court system. And, uh, and I wanted to um, find out what, rather ambitiously, <laughs> you know, what, what further material I could find to begin with. Um, had no idea what became of um, the boy, Robert, and his brother, Natty, after the trial, the old, their trial at the Old Bailey. But, um, but I, was, I was very, um, I felt very sort of restless to know what became of them. And it reminded me a little bit of um, the, the case of the, the boys who killed James Bulger, mm. which I followed at the time. And I thought, well, here's a case where these boys, um, that is long enough ago that maybe we can think about it in a cooler, um, yeah, uh, yes, and a maybe more compassionate way. And also, who knows, maybe it's long enough ago that we can actually find out what happened to the boys themselves and therefore, you know, what, what becomes of a child killer, which mm. is something it's quite hard to, to trace in, mm. in real, in, with recent um, events for all kinds of reasons, most of them sort of ethical. Yeah. Because people, more, we've got much more effectively disguising identities now. Yes, yeah. and um, and the victims and the victims' families are often still around and and liable to be um, hurt by, yeah. by bringing up these things. And yes, and the um, the perpetrators too might be might be damaged by being traced and and um, interviewed, as happened with Mary Bell, for example. That was a very damaging story when she, when she was, um, they interviewed her in the Observer, didn't they? And all went bad, very badly wrong. Yes. But, you, yeah. but, um, but you do find redemptive qualities in this boy and in his later life. And, yes. you know, the, 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 and also it was always shocking to, show, to, to see that places like Broadmoor were more merciful, if anything, then than they are now. And yes. that people perhaps had more um, hope in redemption than, than we do now. Absolutely, yes. Um, I found that with my, with in Mr. Witcher as well that the um, the compassion that the courts and the public showed towards mm. the um, the sort of children teenage children who, children yeah yeah um, was was much greater than I saw in our own in our own time um, but yes with uh, Robert Coombs his his death sentence was commuted he was sent to Broadmoor I, I learned and um, so uh, thrillingly some of the Broadmoor archive had been opened and so although I wasn't able to read his file I was able to read all, m many of the um, stories of the people with whom he was incarcerated and he was uh, the youngest in the institution by some way only 13 he was a sort of baby of Broadmoor and he flourished there he played in the cricket team he became a champion chess player um, he learned the violin and um, he eventually was discharged uh, which and and after rather a lot of work I, I found that he had gone to Australia and served in the First World War, including becoming a stretcher bearer at Gallipoli. And, that, and even after that had um, lived a life of some sort of honor and kindness in that um, he'd rescued a child who was in trouble in a neighboring farm. So that was really all astonishing and I'd not known it when I started on the book. And I felt very um, vindicated in, in mm. sort of following my hunch that there was um, there was something more to this story than than a, just a sort of flat and ugly and vicious crime. Do you think you're always wanting to encourage us to have more mercy and to have more open-ended questions? Do you think that's what your your mission is? 
um, it's what I'm it's what I'm interested in in looking in. I don't think of myself as having a mission in terms of readers, but it's my mission for myself. Yeah, it's my it's the imperative for the research and so on is to find things that are difficult to understand people who are difficult to like or care about and to find a way yeah, to care to care. And that's uh, the way is to understand to contact more and more context more and more. Um, it's sort of yes it's it's just to know to know things and to put them together in a way that tries to understand someone from from how they sat in the world rather than from our distance so it is to sort of think yourself backwards and yeah. um, and and it's very rewarding way when, when you do get to breakthroughs but there would be no um momentum or drama for me in the process of writing if I knew how it would end up or how I'd get there or what I'd find. So it, there is there's always some sort of nail biting about whether, whether it's achievable yeah. um, because it, if it weren't difficult, it wouldn't be, there wouldn't be the, the sort of thrill of the, the, um, the chase of research, which I, I, really, I really enjoy the, I really enjoy the research. Uh, but it has to have that kind of emotional momentum of needing to know things because um, I've come to care about people and I want mm. to understand and want to explain them to myself. Yeah. Like Mr. Witcher. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. who's, your, who's your latest subject? Tell us about um, The latest, it's a book about a woman called Alma Fielding who had a poltergeist in her house in Croydon in 1938. As and, you do. As you do. <laughs> and um, he was smashed up a lot of crockery and threw brass ornaments down the stairs and um, tin openers through the air. And this um, ghost hunter called Nandor Fodor, a Hungarian ghost hunter in London, um, became very interested in the case and investigated it. So it's the story of uh, an investigation and um, it covers the sort of four months, most of the book covers the four months of Fodor's investigation into Alma Fielding and her poltergeist and whether she was truly supernatural and what was driving the events um, in her house and beyond. So he, yeah, so he's a kind of, he's a ghost hunter, so he's a kind of psychical researcher. He's a kind of detective, but, um, of supernatural events. And poltergeists, when there were an awful lot of poltergeists in 1930s, weren't there? That's, that was their, their yeah. peak. I hadn't, I hadn't realized, I, I came across the story in a book that Fodor himself wrote. Um, but when I looked into it, I discovered that, that England was just teeming with ghosts in the 1930s. There were lots of hauntings in old houses. Um, but there were also lots of poltergeists in working class and suburban homes. And at the same time, there was a lot of anxiety brewing about the coming war, which um, hung over much of the 1930s and certainly was sort of feverish by 1938. And it was also, of course, the ghost of the last war. So that's fascinating. Yeah, yes, and the seances that were still abundant in, in England in the 1930s had all been inaugurated after the first war um, when so many people were killed and so many people sought comfort in seances. Uh, so that was still going on while also the dread of another conflict was kicking in. You're very interested in faith and bad faith and good faith, aren't you? A lot of your characters genuinely believe their delusions, the people that you're very interested in and the kind of the people's myths that they have to hold on to. Yes, and I've I've tried in in this book to um, you know to fo follow uh, to allow the possibility at all times of of real supernatural mm -hmm. events um, as the people as the protagonists did you know to respect yeah. that um, that point of view and that's to, and to uh, it's sort of like it's a bit sort of Alice in Wonderland you know you, you're really inhabiting have to try and inhabit the world where these things were possible and um, not just in cranky spiritualistic circles but um, reported in the press kind of on a regular basis 
and uh, and that that this was yes, yeah, so there these were acts of faith, it seances, and um, and expressions of real emotion. And yeah. so, you know, the, the feeling would have been no good as spiritualists if they hadn't believed it, I'm sure. No, no, that's right. Yeah. Are you going to read, so you're going to read us a short bit of that and then we're going to move on to questions, I think. Is that, is that right? Sure. Yeah. This will... is brand new Kate Summerscale's book. Okay. <laughs> brand new book. Exclusive, yeah. exclusive. Is that, yeah. a, is that a bound proof? I've not read, yes, I've read my single bound proof. Um, Wonderful. And press. Um, I haven't read from it before. I thought I'd read a bit about another poltergeist case that um, Nandor Fodor investigated in the 30s. Um, at the end of 1936, Fodor had to lobby for donations to make up a shortfall at the institute where he worked. He worried about his future. He feared that he would be forced to leave England if he lost his job as a psychical researcher. To raise the Institute's profile and his own, he decided to tackle one of the most famous stories of the day, the mystery of Jeff, the talking mongoose. <laughs> Jeff was said to live in a remote farmhouse on the Isle of Man in the Irish Sea with James Irving, a piano salesman turned farmer, his wife, Margaret, and their adolescent daughter, Boyery. Several islanders claimed to have seen or heard Jeff over the years, but he was especially attached to Voiry, while the fullest account of his antiques was Kellogg, kept by Jane since 1932. Though Jeff took animal form, he was a classic poltergeist, unruly, elusive, and rude. On one occasion, he described himself as an earthbound spirit, though on another, he told the Irvings, I am not a spirit. I am just a little extra clever mongoose. <laughs> Jeff threw objects at the family, spat at them, jeered at them, killed rabbits for them, roamed the island gathering gossip by day and returned to raid the larder by night. He was partial to butter and chocolate. The mongoose could speak several languages according to James Irving's log and was proud of his intellectual prowess. I'll split the atom, declared Jeff. I am the fifth dimension. I'm the eighth wonder of the world. Fodor's fellow ghost hunter, Harry Price, failed to flush Jeff out when he spent three days with the Irvings in 1936. Fodor, hoping to get the better of Price, arranged with James Irvings to stay for a week. He promised that he would be no trouble. I would willingly pay you five pounds for the week's board, he wrote him, considering that I'm a vegetarian and eat only vegetables cooked in water for 10 minutes, I do not think that Mrs. Irving would have too much trouble looking after me. At night, he said, he would be happy to rough it anywhere in the house. I hope that Jeff will bear with me and will not throw things at me or spit at me in the night, added Fodor. He has my admiration. He is certainly the cleverest thing far and wide. Tell him also that I shall bring him chocolates and biscuits. <laughs> James Irving later told Ford Fodor that while he was reading this letter to himself in the cottage, Jeff screamed down from the attic, read it out, you fat-headed gnome. <laughs> Irving's put Fodor up for a week in February 1937. Though he did not manage to communicate with Jeff, he was able to verify statements that the mongoose had made about the interior of Ballamore, a grand Manx house which the Ir Irvings claim never to have visited. When Fodor left the Irvings cottage, he installed a contraption to take automatic photographs of Jeff and he left a note for him. Dear Jeff, I am very disappointed that you did not speak to me during the whole week which I spent here. <laughs> I came from a long way and took a lot of trouble in collecting all your clever sayings and I shall lecture about you in my institute where people are extremely interested in your doings. I hoped that you would be a kind and generous mongoose. I believe you to be very good. I brought you chocolates and biscuits and I would have been happy if you had done something for me. Will you send me a message or will you write a letter to me? I should be very pleased if you gave a definite promise that you would speak to me. I would come again in the summer. Congratulations on Ballamore. You scored there, Jeff. With best wishes, your friend, Nandor Fodor. Absolutely. Sorry. <laughs> I wanted to be a mongoose. <laughs> 
<laughs> on his way back to London from the Isle of Man, Fodor called on a physician in Leeds who was interested in psychoanalysis and the supernatural. They discussed Jeff. Fodor told Dr. Maxwell Telling that he thought that James Irving's unhappiness somehow lay behind the Jeff phenomena. Irving had failed in life, he observed, and the mongoose may have been a means to express his unconscious desires. The Leeds doctor was sympathetic to Fodor's views. Where the facts are fantastic, advised Dr. Telling, you should never be afraid of fantastic theories. He suggested that Jeff could be a detached part of Mr. Irving's personality that had taken up residence in an actual mongoose. <laughs> How wonderful. <laughs> Oh, wonderful, wonderful story. I think that mongoose has to be on the cover, I know. <laughs> mongoose is, as I say, charismatic. We should see yeah. more of them on, yeah, yeah, on Twitter, I think. More mongooses. <laughs> famous in 1936 and 37, yeah. Jeff, yeah. He but that, that whole clash of the real and the unreal is wonderful in that story, isn't it? Mm, yeah. Like, and, and the physical. It's fantastic. Yes. Oh, I'm, I'm definitely buying that one. I'm getting on pre-order now. So, um, we've got some wonderful questions here. Um, given the title of the seminar, do you find writing in short bursts, e.g. in a lunch hour, a successful approach? Or how do you get started? So how do you write? Do you write in, do you read and read and read and then write? Or do you write as you go along? Um, I, I, re I do lots of research first and, some, and I take, um, take notes. And then sometimes to make sense of my notes, I sort of write them up. I sort of write paragraphs. And then I look back at some of those paragraphs and think, oh, that's, um, that gives me a basis for a chapter or for a structure or for what it is. So it sort of starts coming together almost accidentally. And then there's a very, um, so it, it's in bits so that it should feel, I think, um, I like it to feel like I'm writing to myself, like I'm writing a kind of diary of my research, and then it builds from, from that. Um, and that it feels sort of fun, intimate, personal, the writing, like reflective, like I'm talking to myself. Um, and that's the way to sort of break the, the, the silence of my, my own thoughts on what I'm reading. Um, but eventually it becomes a much more uh, purposeful, arduous process where I'm uh, putting things together, working them up, swapping them round, mm -hmm. trying them in different orders and, and writing like for a few hours a day. But there's a limit. I mean, I don't think I've ever written for more than three or four hours in a day. That's, that's yeah. enough. Whereas research, I can, you know, carry on for, for indefinitely. <laughs> Reading as long as you like. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think there's, um, I've got a question, do you, how do you define the idea of creativity in relation to non-fiction? So that's that same thing about how do you start inventing a person, I guess, or not inventing a person. Where's the, where do you put the creative in the non-fiction? Um, well, I think, I think that, that it comes mainly from how you decide to, it's about shape and structure. It's the order in which you tell the story that is what makes it the story you want to tell and the interpretation you want to to make of it um, so although of course I mean in a way every every sentence you put together is interpretive and is sort of claiming the story or making it give, giving it a particular shape the most important things are probably things like where do you begin and where do you end mm -hmm. no those those are the things that um, that really are the markers of, of how you are choosing to tell it and um, and that and when once you start doing that, once you start consciously giving an order um, and a rhythm and a pattern to what you've gathered, that that is a creative act, and yeah. um, and it all it all follows from that. Yeah, you might you, be creating they, something with real materials, but it's like a, you know like a a sculptor using found objects to make something. You put them to get the all. The way in which you put them together is everything and yeah. what kind of polish you give them you know there's absolutely yeah is everything do you consciously use sort of creative techniques in that you know to, so um you know how much of a character you're going to give away um using a cliffhanger at the end of a chapter do you consciously do that 
Um, not consciously, but I, I'm, I do it all the time, yes. And I think that's just from sort of lifetime of, of reading books. I was amazed with my first book that, um, that I sort of found I knew how to end a chapter. Not perfectly, mm. but I just thought, oh, that sounds like how a chapter ends. Chapter ends, and, yeah. And, <laughs> and, um, I suppose it, uh, it had just, I'd soaked it in from all the reading I'd, I'd done, that there are certain rhythms, certain cadences or... Um, lengths of big paragraphs and things that just kind of work in terms of how you read and therefore in how you want to tell people things in a yeah. sort of shared language there's a shared language of of books of novel reading and um, that that um, that you follow unconsciously so it's yes. kind of unconscious and similarly in um, in the suspicion of Mr. Witcher there would I made decisions to withhold information that was really by following um, the him as a character and thinking what does he know now and so it, it came quite organically that I would disclose things to the reader as they, he as, learned, he, discovered. as yeah. he discovered them but actually afterwards I realized that this is a convention of detective fiction this is how all detective fiction works that things withheld from the reader in order to um, to create the drama and, and the suspense yes. and you can't do it unfairly or um or it feels manipulative but all writing is manipulative um as long as it's done with uh, you know good great with good intentions to make the, the story um richer and more humane rather than done just to play a play a game a sort of game of superiority read. yeah just to tantalize i remember writing my first book of creative nonfiction, and about halfway through reading the stephen king book about how to write fiction Right. Just because I didn't know how to plot things and then kind of making sure that I was doing what he said just right. to keep the story going. And did you think you poet... were already doing some of, some of that? I was it... doing a bit, but poets have got a tremendous tendency to tell the whole story on top of itself. You have to really fight that if you're a poet to always keep putting the ending in. Right. So yeah, it was good for me, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, which kind of leads us into a question here, which is, have you had to overcome any of the snobbery which is sometimes attached to historical fiction because you were creating a new genre? Did it take readers and critics a while to accept what you were doing? Um, well, I do. I mean, it's it's not historical fiction exactly, but I I do agree there was a certain. I felt when I was writing um, my the first book I wrote, Queen of World Key, was about some was a bit. Uh, bold in as a project because at the time um, most biographies were of people you'd heard of so yeah. there felt a certain kind of nerve to um, pitching a biography of someone you'd never heard of and uh, and it seemed and and it was the subject matter was possibly even a bit sort of sleazy a bit kind of wild and scandalous the stuff of sort That's of tabloid at the time yes not now it feels very a different world but um and similarly when i wrote the suspicions of mr witcher um the idea of true crime is a pretty sleazy job perceived mm, to be it is a deep yeah a voyeuristic um and sort of reveling in other people's misfortune kind of rather sort of pandering to our worst instincts um but I was, I was interested in that. I thought, I mean, I didn't think that was completely wrong. I thought that in some ways, my curiosity about the case um, did reflect some pretty dark instincts. Instincts, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I was, your... yeah. Yeah, I was interested in examining that and as well as indulging it. And uh, mm. so it's, a, it's a difficult thing to pull off. I don't know if I did, but you know, to, that you can both reflect on um, this more dubious aspects of what you're doing and, and, and also enjoy doing them. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, so yes, I think in both, with both those first two books of mine, there was a sense that there wasn't a ready-made market for these things and that they might seem a little bit off, a little bit unsavoury in some way, or my curiosity about them might be. And um, that sort of almost spurred me on. <laughs> <laughs> Just to carry on. Yes. So there's a feminist edge to doing that, isn't there? That you're, you're telling the less conventional stories, the women's stories, children's stories. Yes, yes. Maybe. Definitely. And, and in fact, with um, 
I, I was interested while researching Mr. Witcher to see that there were some very disapproving commentary in the Victorian press about the fact that at the inquest for the little boy who'd been murdered, the room was crammed with women, many of them carrying their own babies, all the women of the village pressing in to look at the body and to hear the story of what had happened. And um, the, the commentators, the male, you know, writers in the newspapers compared it to how much women like to go to bullfights in Spain, that this idea of women liking to be around death and being very curious about murder and violence um, I thought that was that was interesting and um, and you know I think a lot of women like reading detective fiction and like reading psychological horror and true crime um, and I and so I've, I wondered about the connection between that unsavory a, a, you know un, a te rather tasteless curiosity and mm. motherhood actually you know the women cr crowding in with their babies um and so so yes it all it, it, i think wherever something is kind of disapproved of there's always there, there's always something more to be explored there um why is it all being so disapproved of what are we yeah. sitting on there absolutely yeah. but with mr witcher you almost establish a genre it, it, you that what was that like to have a success as big as that was it intimidating? Um, well, it was mostly wonderful. It was, it was great that um, I had left my job to write the book. I had a contract to write it, but I have no idea what I'd do afterwards. So it was a big, um, a big leap in the dark, really. And so the fact that the book succeeded and um, on, a, on a scale that would enable me to write another book working full time because those books are quite labor intensive I can't I they're not the sorts of things I can do alongside a, a job mm. um uh, that was that was brilliant I felt um it, it felt great and um made me very happy it was of course a bit intimidating to actually write the the next book <laughs> as, <laughs> as well but uh, that was a, a very small price to pay for the luxury of being able to do it yeah, this is a related question here that says, um, have you researched any projects and then decided that you, you had to park them that it wasn't going to work? And if so, why? Um, yes, I, I, I don't think I've ever researched anything for very long. Maybe I've researched something for like three weeks or a month and I've got really into it and wanted to write a book. I slightly tend to erase them from my memory afterwards. Um, <laughs> But the reason, I think all, always the reason that I'd give up something that I was really curious about was just that there's not enough material. And you really don't know to begin with how much there'll be when you willfully choose obscure subjects as I do. It's almost um, a given that the, 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 the story should not have been written about in any, at any length before. Um, Though, having said that, my latest book, is, uh, there had been a book written about it before, and Mr. Witcher. But, but the, um, the stories I've had to give up on, it's been because I, I haven't fa felt that there would be enough material to sort of play with and to give, um, to, to give the proper context and colour mm. to the individuals. Um, and, and so it would be too thin. It's a, you always want to go into something with a sense of there being quite a lot of rich texture, both in the immediate material, like what about the story can you find out, but also the, um, the sort of related, uh, the allusions, the, th the ideas in the culture um, that, that around the story that mm. will be interesting to pursue. Why there are so many ghosts in England in the 1930s. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yes. and all the fascinating answers to that. Yeah. So we've got a related question here, which is um, how recent would be too recent for a book that you're going to write like yours? How, why, do you always go into the past? This most recent one is relatively recent for you, isn't it? The 30s is relatively yeah. Yes, it is relatively recent. Um, I think uh, I, most of my books have been set in the 19th century and that is quite a comfortable distance. Um, because you've, you've got this weird world that is also somehow imaginable and um, reachable. 
uh, the, the good thing about writing stuff set in the path quite long ago like that, uh, more than a hundred years ago, is that um, you have a certain freedom from uh, hurting the feelings or uh, of people who are still around. But in my last book, The Wicked Boy, I discovered that, um, with the, the characters in the story uh, towards the end were still alive and were very shocked by the revelations of my research. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can't really shield yourself from, from this at all. Absolutely. I mean, in it, that was a whole hundred years ago, so that would just be people that yeah. knew him at the end of his life. Yeah. Even, yeah. Exactly. So that was a, a murder in 1895. And even a few years ago, it had the capacity to really shock and wound people who were sort of sort of weirdly within its orbit. Um, so that really took me aback. Uh, and yes, it's a reminder that, uh, that setting things in the past does not totally shield you from the reality of, of li you know, living people mm -hmm. and, and their emotions and responses. Um, so the the the, my first book about Jo Carstairs was written straight after she died. So because I wrote the obituary, um, so she died in ninety seven, and it sort of spanned a century. And um, and yes, my latest book is set in the thirties. It's a kind of return to that kind of period, I suppose, the interwar period. And uh, and and in this case too, I've traced descendants. So. Mandel Fodor, the ghost hunter, his daughter is still alive, and um, grandsons of Alma Fielding, the woman whose um, house the poltergeist oh. attacked, mm. they are um, they are still living and, and have helped me with the book. Right, so you wouldn't go any more recent than that because that that is already quite close enough to the bone. Yeah, well, yeah. who knows? But it, but as I say, I like I like the feeling. I've never written about anything that's happened within my lifetime, I suppose. Mm. And maybe yeah. that's an important um, boundary for me in terms of stepping into another world. Mm. Absolutely. So, yeah, it, it, just lo looking so for, more, for more questions here. Um, your, Kate mentioned that one of her early jobs was an editor. How do you work with an editor now? That's always a nice nubby question to work with. Do you work <laughs> with an editor now? Now, again, there's ethical questions coming back. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, it's sort of different. I, book editors are very different from newspaper editors. So I did a lot of very close editing uh, in newspapers, you know, sort of reworking sentences and so on. And that does happen with books in a way, but um, the more... Uh, astonishing stuff to me that you get from a from a publisher from the editor of a book is the the broad brush like the structure mm. of the whole thing about perspectives and, and shapes and so on and that I find tremendously helpful as a different perspective because my editing background doesn't doesn't encompass that that kind of thinking it's much more um, close up um, and so that's in very enjoyable and interesting. And I, I don't find it difficult to take advice on that kind of thing. I, I'm very curious and uh, open to those. Uh, and I'm probably much more sort of uh, precious about things at a, at a close up level because I'm used to reworking and I've, by the time I submit a book, I've done, the, you know, so the broad brush is fine, but don't mess with your sentences. <laughs> well, you know, um, I'm, I'm more likely to have view, view to feel um, to have a counter argument on the sentence and the broad brush. I'm always just really interested at how it reads to someone outside. It's also just difficult when you've been working on something for a long time to see it in, in mm. the round and see the whole thing. And so um, you're always sort of really eager to hear from the first readers what, yeah. what that feels it's, like. It makes you feel less lonely, I always think, when you have a good editor. You know, it suddenly breaks into the great isolation that's been you in that project for three years and then someone talks to you about it. Yes, yeah. yes. So you feel tremendously sort of glad and grateful. You forgot cool. yeah. in the process, in this very sort of solitary process of writing, you forget that anyone else can play a part at all. <laughs> right. Else yeah. ever read yeah. it and all of that. And then, yeah, yeah, you do yeah. get it. I, I love my editor, I think it's great. 
Mm. Help is very important. Um, we have got we've got five minutes, so we can have a couple more questions. Um, the, how many hours a day do you write? I think we've asked that one, answered that one. What are some of the ethics or ethical challenges of writing creative nonfiction about historical figures? I think we've answered, we, we have um, asked some of those. It, it, I mean, do you ever think, I, this is too challenging writing all this truth, I think I'll go and write a novel? No, never, never. Well, actually I say that, I think um, it's, it's something that does occur to me sometimes in mid book, and it's a sign of crisis. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it, I'm just going to make it up. Yeah, I, and um, I, do, I do sometimes hit a wall uh, in terms of either the research or my ways of thinking about and using what I've, what I've gathered that makes me think I cannot make this work as a story without um, attributing some feelings to these people, to, um, you know, to to kind of getting it to, to knowing what they, th they thought and felt. And of course, as a nonfiction writer, you, you can never know that. You can, um, you can hint at it and lead the reader towards what you think they were feeling and thinking by the way that you shape things and so on. But um, you can't know. And that can sometimes feel like an impossible barrier to making a story move along and making a reader care and um, so so then it's at that moment that you think well maybe the only way this story could possibly work were if I take some great greater liberties with it and um, make it into a work of fiction instead of non-fiction um, but then that seems um, heartbreaking because it feels mm. as if it's throwing away all the the truth the nuggetiness and the texture of what's real and uh so so far i've i've never gone down that route i have sometimes done little um experiments with like just writing as if i were in the voice of the characters in the books to sort of teach myself or to, to hear what, what I actually think that they are thinking and feeling, even though I can't use that in a nonfiction book. Um, because I do find that it's only by uh, writing that you can work out what you think about the story. I don't come to the, to the laptop with an idea about what story I need, I'm going to tell. I just start writing and then it reveals itself what it is that I think and what I think is interesting or moving or funny. Um, so sometimes you have to do, I, I have done occasionally done those sort of imaginative experiments in order to reflect back at myself, what I, what I'm, what I'm imagining the, the characters. I hope, I hope you've collected those because I think the British library needs to get those in its collection as well. <laughs> quickly eliminate <laughs> the imaginative experiments of Kate Summerscale. Mm. <laughs> you get a lot of feeling through the description of scenes though when you describe the courthouses or the or the, you know, the trials of the little boys or those things just in the in the way you describe what's actually happening I think you, you think we're, we're very often moved. Well I think um, definitely I, I've, I've learned from doing this that um, place places um, give you a, a huge amount of like uh, imaginative freedom in some ways when you write about them but especially if you can go and see them for real then you're you're reporting your own impressions you can use the words that um you know that that, that you would would use you know you're not filtering newspaper reports and other people's there's an actual first-hand a sense of this is what the vegetation looks like around the house. These are the flowers. This is the building in which the boy's body was found. And um, it's always remarkable when I do go on sort of site visits while researching, and I'm almost shocked to realize that these places are real because the stories have become so internalized in, in terms of the research and writing, and, um, and that they're available to me as places to write about and as scenes that I can describe live, as it were. Well, and you certainly, yeah, do you certainly do. I think making all of that alive is your particular talent, bringing the past to life. As, um, and, um, 
you know, we love all your books. I'm sure that there are many people listening here who also do. So that we've come to our two o'clock. Thank you so much for your questions. I'm um, talking to Patrick Gale tomorrow. And um, just tell us the name of your upcoming book again, Kate, so that we can all buy it. It's called The Haunting of Alma Fielding. Haunting of Alma Fielding has got to be on everyone's list for October. It's going to be very, very exciting. Thank you so much for talking to me. That's been wonderful. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. Thanks.